Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from John chapter 21, and I'll start at verse 4 and read 4 through 17, and this is what it says. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. They cast therefore and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That disciple therefore whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciple came in the little boat for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. When he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us eyes that see your hand here, a new creation, the risen Christ alive in us and create space that we might experience your presence here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's possible from the way I speak, you may have guessed that I'm from the South. Yep. Not from Boston. Sometimes people hear my voice and say, you know, I bet he's from Boston or from Canada. But nope, I'm from the South. And I've lived in the South all my life. A part of being from the South is you realize there's some things that aren't quite the same as everywhere else. One of those things is, yes, Southerners have an irrational fear of snow. I don't know why, but we do. Also in the South, 
everybody, I don't mean some people, I mean everybody has at least one person in their family that their bubble's not just quite on level. I mean, eh, it's a little to the left, a little to the right. They're just not, not on center. A little quirky, a little eccentric. It might be an Aunt Martha or an Uncle Billy. Just not quite right. And you know what? If you're from the South, I bet you have that person in mind right now. And if you don't have that person in mind, guess what? <laughs> it's because it's you. Yeah, there, everybody in the South has at least one family member, and it might be just not, their bubble's not quite on the center. The third thing that I've noticed over the years about the South is Southerners can't say goodbye. It's just not possible. I, I can remember, I first discovered it when my, I was in high school, my sister was in college, and she brought a, home, a friend home to, to meet the family. Oh, we talked, chatted all around supper table. Supper was over, and we visited for just a little bit, and he said goodbye, and he got up, and he left. Well, we couldn't figure out what we did to offend him. He said goodbye, and then he left. I, we, we, I, I was certain it was something my brother had said. Hey, he, just, he, he offended him in some way, but it turned out, well, he wasn't from the South, and when he said goodbye, he meant it, and he left. Well, that's not what Southerners do at all. You say goodbye, and that doesn't mean anything. It means it's time for maybe second dessert, something like that, that there's, you're going to hang around a little longer, tell another story, or maybe break out a board game. You say goodbye the second time, and, well, it's time for popcorn, and we're going to, you know, sit around and chat a little more. The third time you say goodbye, you might go to the front door. And the fourth time, you might actually open the front door and go into the front yard. Sometimes you'll linger there for a little while. Southerners can't say goodbye. That's how I know John is from the south. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's South Galilee or South Israel, but he's from the south because he can't say goodbye. John has just constructed... Maybe the most beautiful book in the Bible. I mean, it's, it's written incredibly well. When you begin to study ancient Greek, John's the book you go to because the sentences are complete sentences. They make sense that he's got these literary devices. He has themes that you can follow all the way from the beginning to the end of the Bible. He's got a, he's got a, a plot he actually has a climax of his book, and he has an ending. He has a beginning that's, that's clear to let you know what this book is about. Chapter 1 tells you that in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of men. Life. He says 78 times throughout the book, he mentions life. Chapter 10, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Last week at the resurrection, we know that it's a, it's a story about life. And we, because John has laid out seven miracles in his book, each representing the seven days of creation, of the old creation. John lets us know at the beginning, this is that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It starts the same way Genesis does, that it's a creation story, and those seven miracles are the, the seven days of creation. And the eighth miracle is the resurrection. And it takes place on the first day of the week. That's when the new creation takes place. It's when the old creation took place on the first day of the week. First creation takes place in a garden. The new creation takes place in a garden. The old creation began when, when God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living being. The new creation, well, it's when Jesus, Jesus opens his mouth and he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The, the new creation, new life begins when Jesus breathes, breathes the Spirit of God in disciples like, like you and me. And, and that, that John, 
John wraps all this into a bow in the very last verse of chapter 20 and he ties it up and he says in verse 31, but these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. He tells you at the beginning why he wrote the book. He tells you in the middle while he wrote the book, 78 times throughout the book. And here he ties it into a bow at the closing of his book. At least you think it's the closing because it's chapter 20. This is why I've written it, so that you may believe Jesus and believing you may have life in his name. Well, that seems like it's ready to, to just dust off your hands and say, dun, dun, it's finished. But then there's one more chapter. One more story, and that's what we read. John can't say goodbye. Is it just, but, but one more dessert? Yes, but one more story, just, just, just a little bit more. And that's the story that we read this morning. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That John gives just one more thing. Just one more thing. The disciples, it's time to go back to work. Yes, they've seen the risen Christ twice, as a matter of fact. Yes, it's been wonderful. But yes, it's time to, to get back to work. They're fishing. There's seven of them. They're not just out there wetting a hook and talking about what, what's been and kind of reminiscing on the past. No, they're working. It's hard work. They've been working all night. They didn't catch a thing. The next morning, there's someone standing on the shore. They don't recognize that it's Jesus risen from the grave. And he says to them, you haven't caught anything, have you? They answer with one word, no. Now, I'll give you a hint. When somebody gives you a one-word answer and that answer is no, they really don't want a lot of conversation. They aren't hoping that you'll jump in and interject a little more. They aren't looking for instruction. They aren't looking for anything. No. It is one of the ways that humans everywhere just cut off conversation. But there's good news. Jesus doesn't stop at our no. And he begins to push and he begins to prod. And he says, cast your nets on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll find a catch. Well, the really amazing thing is that the disciples do what he says. I mean, the person least likely to know where the fish are, it's somebody who's standing on the shore. It's the folks out in the boat that might see some swells or, or, or be able to tell the way that the, 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 the currents are moving. It's not going to be somebody on the shore, but they obey. They obey in the small things. And life in Christ, life in Jesus Christ, is a life of obedience. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about. To obey. To obey in the small things. Our God is a God of small things. Jesus talks about the faith of a mustard seed. Well, even though it's so small, it's enough to move a mountain. Our God is a God of the small things. Yeast, just a little bit of it in a lump of dough, it makes the whole lump rise. Our God is a God of small things. It's five loaves and two fish that feed 5,000. And it's obedience, obedience in the small things that Life begins in the obedience and the small things, in, the th in things that seem inconsequential. If you feel distant from God this morning, I want to say try obedience. Try obedience. Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. So often we tend to think of love as the way we feel. Well, that's a natural love. But the love and the word that he's using here isn't a, a natural love that we're born loving our friends and family and those who, who please us. 
This is a love that, called agape, whose root is, is not in the emotions, it's a root in the will. It's a choice, it's a decision that we love not only lovable people, but even the enemies. It's the way Jesus put it. Not just friends and family, but even the stranger. That we not, don't just love folks who are like-minded, that it's an act of the will. It's a choice. It's what we do. It's a love that's a, put into action. It's not a love of the emotion. And in obedience, in obedience, we, we, we keep his commandments. Commandments that, well, are the small things, the little things, the things that we might like to, to look over or sweep under the rug. Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, search me, O God, and try my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. That it's not just the robbing banks and killing people, which those are big things. And by the way, if you're doing them, it's, you need to stop. That it's the little things, the things in our heart and our, our mind. The things that we practice that no one can see. The things that, that maybe nobody else knows in our hearts. Those stories that we tell ourselves that have nothing to do with what Jesus has told you or me. Doesn't have anything with obeying Jesus. That the psalmist says, search me, O God, and, and know my thoughts. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And if there's any wicked or hurtful way in me, lead me to the everlasting way. Jesus is the way. And he offers life to you and me, the risen Christ in the here and now, that has power, power, yes, over those those anxious thoughts, power in our hearts and our minds, that we know that, that as John tells us in, in 1 verse 12, that we're children of God, that for everyone who receives him, he's given power Power, power that we may know that we're children of God. And we may do away with those old stories that we believe about ourselves and begin leaning on Him, relying on Him, and obeying Him in the small things. Life, life in Jesus is a life of obedience in the small things, but it's also a life of abundance. Verse 11 it says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. 153 large fish, not just fish, large fish. There's seven of them. 153 fish for breakfast. I hope they're hungry. That's over 21 fish per person. And there they they are. It's, it's, it's abundance. It's abundance that in this life, an abundance that Jesus points to again and again and again. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Not just enough life to get by or squeak by but a life where you're able to, to see him everywhere and in all things. 
Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Riches that are everywhere. Everywhere. The first miracle in the Gospel of John, Jesus is at a wedding in Cana in Galilee. His mother comes to him and he sa she says to him, they have no more wine. So he calls for the ceremonial pots of water to be filled to the brim. Not just partway up, but to the brim. Now each of these pots hold from 20 to 30 gallons each. That's, that's between 120 and 180 gallons of water. And he turns the water into wine. This new life. This new creation, it's an abundant life. It's a life that's full and overflowing. It's a life that's flourishing. The old creation, the old creation tries to get us to be afraid, to believe that life instead of abundant is a life of scarcity. A life where we must get and gain and hoard in order to have anything at all. That's not new life in Jesus. New life in Jesus, we come to know the riches of God that are all around us. And, and rather than meeting the world with closed fists and hands that are hoarding, that we meet the world with an open hand that's generous and giving. It's a new life, an abundant life that's offered to you and to me. Life in Jesus, it's a life of obedience and it's a life of abundance. And the third thing that I want to talk about this morning, it's also the new life in Jesus is a life of forgiveness. We read the story, one of the most popular stories in the Bible where three times... Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter answers, yes. Yes. Yes, you know that I love you. Why? Why three times? Well, it's been three times that Peter denied Jesus. Jesus told him that he would do that before the rooster crowed, but he did it anyway. As much as he tried, he didn't have power to keep from doing the very thing Jesus said that he would do. That it was going into the courtyard. After Jesus was, was led away to a mock trial, Peter wanted to stay close enough that it, he, he could, could maybe see and hear something, but he wouldn't be involved. And going into the courtyard, it was a slave girl that identified him as one of Jesus' disciples. And Peter denied knowing him. Once inside the courtyard, he was standing by the fire and uh, somebody else identified him as one of Jesus' followers and he denied him. He stepped away from the fire and still someone recognized him and he denied him. That's when the rooster crowed. And now Jesus is offering forgiveness again and again and again. Got a good friend. His name's Bob Christopher. Bob and I, he's one of the best friends I've ever had. We've been friends since we were in four-year-old kindergarten together. We went to school together, played football, baseball, basketball, church, youth group, whole thing. In college, we'd get jobs together in the summer. We just have always hit it off. Always. We've hit it off very well, and we've We've stayed in touch over the years. He moved to Dallas, Texas shortly after college. I was in his wedding. And a few years back, he wrote a book called Simple Gospel, Simply Grace. He began to develop a radio program that's nationally syndicated. Well, not only here in the U.S., but also in Canada. And people call in questions about the Bible. Sometimes it's a, a question about a Bible verse that they've presented that day. Sometimes it's, it's just questions that they have about the Christian life. I was talking to Bob a little while back, and I said, what's the number one question that you get? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, the number one question is about forgiveness. 
So that people believe that they're beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. That there's something that they've done that's too great, that's too bad, that's too awful for God to forgive them. I have good news. Maybe the best news that you've ever heard, that's the message of the cross. That Jesus died on the cross to forgive you and to forgive me. And John wants to make sure that you don't want, that you don't miss that message of the cross. So here he gives it specifically, personally, to Peter again and again and again. And that message is, is offered to you and to me. A forgiveness, a forgiveness that we can't get just by thinking good thoughts about ourselves. It's a forgiveness that's offered by Jesus. It's a forgiveness that has power today, a new life where the risen Christ begins to, to live through us, begins to live through us. It may be that this morning that you're in that place, that very place where you think that there's something that you've done that's too great, too bad, too awful for God to forgive you. And you've never prayed to receive that forgiveness. Or maybe that forgiveness was dictated by your feelings. God never intended forgiveness to depend on our feelings. It depends on the risen Christ, and he's alive, and he's here, and he's now. And I want to pray with you this morning that you receive that forgiveness. Or it may be that you receive that forgiveness, but you've had trouble with obedience. Obedience to God in the small things. That you felt good about Jesus, but that... um. You felt distant from God because you've, you've not been obedient in the small things. Jesus rose from the grave to give you and me power we don't have to be obedient in the small things. Or it may be that that old creation has taken hold in you and you just have a natural inclination to, to, to get and grab and to hoard Know that Jesus rose from the grave to give you and me power we don't have. To open our hands. To open our lives with the generosity of abundance. Not of scarcity, but abundance. And I want to pray with you this morning. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, we need the power that you have. A power, not just a long time ago, but power today that we might receive new life of a forgiven people, knowing that you took that old creation and on the cross, you took the guilt and the shame, you took the sin, you took the fear and you nailed it to the cross and took away its power once and for all. And when you rose from the grave, you rose to live that power through us that we might know that forgiveness today. Or maybe that We've not been obedient. We've not been following you. Maybe we've tried, but we've not asked for your power, your strength in our lives. And we've begun to believe in our heart the stories that aren't true, that we're less than a child of God. Breathe. Breathe, breathe within us, Lord, the power of obedience in the small things. Power that we know what it is to have an abundant life, a life where we, we give and give freely rather than just protect ourselves and gain and grab and, and hoard out of fear. Instead, we know a, a love that cast out all fear, a love that comes from you, the risen Christ. Let it be breathed on us this day. It's in Christ's name we pray.
Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.